unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Isaiah 53. I'm going to begin from the first verse. The Bible says, Who hath believed our report? It's a question. Who hath believed our report? This is Isaiah asking a fundamental question. Who has believed our report? Who has believed our report? He says, and to whom is the arm of God revealed? To whom is the arm of God revealed? This is one of the most, you know, interesting thoughts, you know. Yes, it is coming to the believer as a question and to the non-believer alike, okay? But there's a depth in what Isaiah is trying to speak to us this evening. And I pray that by God, you'll catch this because uh, we're living in a time where people ask questions, you know, such as, where is the power that now in our present time that we read in the book of Acts, where is the power, you know, that we used to see back in the days, in the days of the prophets and the judges and the priests and the kings of Israel? Where is the anointing we see in the early church through the holy apostles and the things that God wrought through them, the mighty works and wonders, the power, the glory of God exemplified through the person of Jesus Christ and in the simplest way on the calling of that name of Jesus Christ. Okay, so people ask questions. Many people across the world have questions. Where is this power? You know, why don't we see power the way we used to see it in scripture, you know? And that does not mean that the power of God is not present in present day. It only means three things. One, that there are people who do not have the opportunity to see the wonder-working power of God, okay? Recently, when we had a crusade, quite a number of people walked to me and said, it's the first time I've seen a miracle with my eyes. You know, many had lived the life of salvation 10, 20, 15 years of their lives, and they've heard of a healing God, but they've never seen miracles. And when I'm talking about miracles, we're talking about real miracles. In the Crusades, we saw mad people who were insane for years, some since, you know, they were little, and God delivered them. We saw limbs growing in the Crusade. We saw children that were born blind uh, receive sight for the first time in their lives. We saw, you know, crippled people walking up straight. And so for some people, it was the first time they saw a miracle. And they said, oh my God, it's the first time I'm seeing a miracle. But that does not mean that the whole world out there has had the opportunity to experience the wonder-working power of God. You know, and now it's bad, it's worse. It's getting worse in some circles, even of some religious institutions, you know, because even some religious people now do not believe in the healing power of God. They do not believe in the demonstrative power of God. They look at it as an old story, you know. If we have to be as liberal as we can, we accept what is and, you know, accept what can't be, you know, and live life that way, you know, more realistic, pragmatic, you know, down to earth as calculative to the world as the world can calculate us as interpretive by the world as the world can easily interpret us. They accept things the way they are in the faith. And now I'm talking about believers. We have believers who have actually given up on believing God for great things. You know, when they're diagnosed with incurable diseases, they know that that's the end of their life. When they hear bad reports about their life, some of them come into that acceptation to think, you know, I think this is it. This is God's will concerning my life. And you know, that's how God has slated this day to be. I think it's the will of God that I'm going through this. And some people have accepted, you know, the influence 
influence of darkness and the power of evil spirits over their lives, the oppression of the devil in the name of, you know, this is, you know, the will of God concerning my life. I think I've accepted it. I think, you know, that's how life is supposed to be. You know, demons are supposed to come sometimes and strangle me or not, or sometimes things are supposed to come and do this to me or not. And so some have actually come to that. Why? Because they no longer see the power of God. I have seen power in my life. I believe there is quite a lot of people that are seeing early church miracles and probably even more. I've seen people healed under my shadow. I've demonstrated that in church. Hanky is put on the sick heel. We've demonstrated that. We've seen the things that the liberties of the spirit can stretch in a man's heart when a man is ready to believe God. But not many believers out there, not many people out there believe in the wonder-working power of God. And some even have had an opportunity to hear the gospel, to hear, you know, what Jesus can do and who Jesus is. And some have been disappointed because we've sometimes opened meetings for them and, you know, invited them for meetings. And the Jesus we're speaking about did nothing the one we're speaking about. But that doesn't mean that the Jesus Christ of the Bible is void of his power, is void of the authority, is void of the glory and the anointing that befits him without measure, okay? And so that is what I want to emphasize on tonight. I want to go deeper into revealing to us, you know, the whole mystery touching the power of God, touching the arm of God. You know, the Bible says that who has believed our report, Isaiah is saying, who has believed this? Okay. And he says, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? What is the arm of the Lord? The arm of the Lord is the power of God to fulfill his purposes. That's what we call the arm of the Lord. The arm of the Lord is the power of God to fulfill his purposes. Okay, so if you read that Jesus is a healer, we're talking about the power that avails that healing, regardless of the disease that you're talking about. When you're talking about wealth, we're talking about the power that fulfills that word in your life to enjoy wealth according to his glory in Christ. You understand? Because he says the devil came but to steal, kill, and destroy. But the Bible says, but I am come that ye might have life. The Amplified says, until it overflows, that you might have it in abundance, until it overflows. Jesus came that we might have life. He came that we might have life. Okay? And no Christian should be sorry for enjoying the God life. No Christian should be apologetic for enjoying the God life. Okay? And so we, we're talking about the arm of the Lord. We're talking about the power of God that is available to fulfill divine purpose. Okay, that everything that he has purposed in his word is yeah and amen to the glory of the Father. That when you believe God for something, you are sure that you're going to see it come to pass. You're going to see its accomplishment to the glory of God. That is what we want to emphasize. What I feel impressed on my heart to share with you is how to connect to this power. Is how to connect to this power. Years ago, when I was just starting to grow in the faith from childhood, you know, from that early life of experiencing God uh, into my youth years. In my youthful years, I cultivated a life of connecting to God through a certain, you know, pattern of prayer, you know, because prayer has degrees too, okay? And prayer is only to the degree of the understanding that you have with God. And so many times I tell people that sometimes it's not about how long you shout. It's not about how many days you spend on the prayer mount and praying. It's about the quality of your prayer. And the quality of your prayer is equated to your place of understanding with God because every believer functions from the place that they carry in the spirit. You know, the Bible says he has appointed the times before and the boundaries of their habitation. We're not just talking about physical habitation, we're talking about spiritual habitation. And how I wish I could easily imprint it to the believer watching me right now, what it means to have a certain place in God, you know, because that's the foundation of the assurance of the man of God, of the believer, you know, of the child of God, of the minister of Christ. And now this goes simply beyond the demonstration of the gift to the ministration, you know, of the person of Jesus Christ, the supply of the spirit of Christ, Paul calls it, the supply of the spirit of Christ. Because remember, the spirit of Christ existed, all right? He existed before. And I'm going to come to that. But during that time, a lady one time calls me on phone and says, I think I need help. Probably could have been about what? 
20 years old. And so she calls me and she says, hey, I'm stuck. There's a lady, there's a young girl who is mad, you know, she's run mad and it's the aggressive kind. She's, you know, punching walls, screaming and doing all these kinds of things. And uh, I have been praying for her for the last 24 hours. You know, I pray, go have some to eat, come back in the room, pray, go have some to eat, come back in the room to pray. And nothing is taking place, you know. And she says, can you come and we join hands and pray uh, for this young girl? And so during that time, the Spirit of God had started to share in my spirit the understanding of this power, you know, the arm of the Lord, the power of God that is available, you know. And there's a lot of things that I had experienced spiritually through that personal communion with God. And I remember very well, I come out of my father's home then, I used to live back home with my parents. It was a walkable distance, I go into this woman's house, I see this girl and she's, oh my goodness, she's so possessed, you know, she's so possessed and oppressed of the devil, she's all torn and, you know, wasted. And I remember, I look at this girl straight in the eye and I could see the spirit that was at work on her and I rebuked this spirit off, you know, this young girl's life and immediately this girl comes back to sanity. And the person, you know, asks me a question and said, how did you do that? You know, they asked me, how did you do that? Because they had been tiring for more than, you know, almost a whole day, 24 hours, trying to cast out a devil, you know, and they could not. And this person had spent quite a long time in the faith. And so they were saying, how, you know, by what part do you do this? Because they thought that probably there was some sort of extra power that sort of, you know, was in my spirit, you know, that with something special or unique to work for me and not for them. But this for me fundamentally became a question, a bigger question for the bigger church, the bigger body of Christ at large. You know, how do we heal the sick? How does a blind eye open? You know, if you've never seen a blind eye, it's hard to believe it. If you've prayed for it long and you've never seen that miracle, it's one thing, but the day you see a blind eye opening, you know, a deaf ear being unstopped, a dumb person speaking for the first time, somebody starting to mutter words and they start a conversation. It's a very revealing experience, okay? And some people say, how do we, you know, get in, in contact with this thing? How do we connect? Because we believe, we believe in the name, we believe. But how come we don't see the results, you know? And all I could tell this person, this individual who was praying for this girl was, I think it is because the Lord has dealt with me in the revelation, you know, of his person a certain way. And that's by the grace of God, I pray that I will minister to the person watching me because what opens a blind eye will fix your finances, will fix your marriage, will fix your children, will fix everything. It's the same anointing, it's the same power, and it's available. And I'm not just talking about people who claim to see miracles that they've not really seen, you know, or miracles that are you know, simple miracles, but you know, they carry a pride in what they think they've seen, but they've not really tangibly seen miracles that are mind blowing. I'm talking about mind blowing miracles, okay? I'm talking about raising the dead kinds of miracles. I've seen all these things by the grace of God, but we cannot say that the whole Christendom connects to this, okay? And why are we under lockdown? Why are we seeing curfews in nations? Why are we, you know, seeing Governments looking up. Why are we seeing churches being stopped to worship and pray? Why are we seeing all of this? Because there's an answer that is needed, you know. There's a solution that is needed and governments are doing the best they know how God bless their souls for that. But what about the church? What's the answer of the church? What's the answer of the believer that is watching me right now? What is the answer of the new creation in Christ? What is the answer of the body of Christ? Okay. And I know that some men or ministers of the gospel are carrying from this and they are drawing away from the responsibility that it should be of this hour for us as the church. Okay. And I told people this period has a grace available for us to have the next awakening for the world. Because the problem the world is dealing with is so small. You know, recently somebody in the ministry sent me a message. His father was in the United States. I believe he was diagnosed with COVID, uh, you know, and they were taken in. And this guy just got our summons, our faith summons, and sent them to the father and told the guy, listen, all right? And the man listened to these things. And the man said, you know, I don't believe I can fall sick. I refuse to fall sick. Nothing will touch me and stuff like that. And he continues confessing. And the guy says after just a few days, he was released, you know, COVID-free, no pain, no affliction, no nothing. And of course, science will say, 
say, oh yeah, yeah, they're the lucky ones. There's some who, you know, get afflicted and sort of go through this without much pain. Yeah, you can give all the reasons that you want to give. But, you know, the man in that position was saying, no, it is the wonder working word of the Lord, you know, because I believed the word in the time when the symptoms and signs had started on me and I refused them. I declared the word and the power of God that I have in Christ and disease left. But that's just one case. There's multitudes of people. We've seen stage four cancers. We've seen all manner of disease heal. And Jesus is the same today, yesterday and forever. Okay. And so I feel it in my spirit, a kind of stirring to sort of get people for us to awaken to the hour and understand what God requires of us. And I told people, believers, stop to even think for a moment. Why would you think that disease should come into your body and kill you with the life of God in you? Why should you even raise a consciousness in your spirit that disease will get inside your body and kill you? All right. How many believers across the world are actually kept? Not because they're not exposed, you know, but because the grace, the power of God is available. Okay, the power of God is available. We have to believe God. I'm not just talking about one disease. I'm talking about all manner of sickness. Talking about all manner of sickness. The world will not entertain that, but that's the world. We are a new creation in Christ. Okay, now Jesus Christ has existed, you all know, for time, even before he came in the flesh, the Bible says he was the rock from which they drank. Okay, now the prophets of old are connecting to God with their souls. Okay, and as they are connecting to God with their souls, they start to come in contact, you know, with the person of Jesus Christ, with the spirit of Christ. And when they come in contact with the spirit of Christ, the example is Isaiah. He sees the arm of the Lord. He sees the mystery of the arm of the Lord. And his biggest fear, he says, who shall believe our report? He says, who shall believe our report? He says, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who carries this revelation? Okay, because he had seen, he had walked by the Spirit, and the Spirit, the person of Jesus Christ, started to shape out in Revelation. He started to connect to this arm. He started to connect to the person of Jesus Christ. Even earlier before, in Isaiah 51, I believe, verses uh, 9, okay, he says, Awake, awake, and put on strength. He says, O arm of the Lord. He has brought that statement again. O arm of the Lord. He says, Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations old. He says, Have thou not eat that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Okay. He's saying, We have seen the testimony of the arm of the Lord, the saving power of God according to purpose. Okay, existing ancient times. The man of the spirit, the prophet Isaiah, has walked back in the spirit and seen this arm of the Lord. He has seen the wonder working power of God in times ancient. And in that time, he's trying to awaken that. He's saying, you know, that spirit is still existent as was before, still existent now to do the things that must be done to the glory of God. And so he's trying to awaken that. In Isaiah 52, verse 10, he says, The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our Lord. He has seen it. He has said that the spirit of Christ, the arm of the Lord is so bare. It is so bare that God has availed the arm for everyone to see, for all eyes to see. All right. Now, the only issue is do they perceive what they see? Do they carry the understanding of what they see? Do they carry the full apprehension of what they see? Do they understand what we see in the person of Jesus Christ? When he was the rock from which they drank, did they have the revelation of that rock? Did they have the revelation of that rock? The Spirit of Christ has existed from the foundation of the world. The Bible says, your father Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. He was glad when he saw it. Okay. Abraham saw Jesus Christ and he was forwarded to his day. His experiences, the ministry of the Christ on the earth, the death and resurrection of the Christ on the earth. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and he was glad. What was the point? What was the essence? What was the foundation of the joy in the spirit of Abraham? Abraham had seen the person of Jesus Christ, the arm of the Lord that had been revealed to him in a way, you know, so deep than the people of his time. So yes, to see is one thing, but to perceive what you see is another. 
all right? To see is one thing, but to understand what you see is another. Abraham saw that. Moses saw the person of Jesus Christ. He says, and the righteousness of faith speaketh this wise. Okay, the prophets, even Balaam, okay, he saw. He saw the root of Jesse. You know, they saw stars in David. They saw the seed of Abraham. They saw the prophetic. They saw it through the Spirit of God. And they saw Jesus Christ revealed. And when they started to see the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ, it was inevitable for the arm of the Lord not to be a revelation because he is the arm of the Lord. He says, they shall all see his salvation. That's why in Romans he says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone, the Bible says, that believeth to the Jew first and also to the what? To the Greek. He says, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. No believer should be ashamed of the gospel. There's a boldness that every believer is supposed to have in God. You are supposed to have a certain boldness in God. You're supposed to have boldness in your health. You're supposed to have boldness in your abilities because you are tuned to the abilities of God, to the sufficiencies of God. You're supposed to have confidence in the ability of the person of Jesus Christ and what his word has said to be true. But there are many people, many believers who even fear to believe God for the simplest things of the hour. Simplest things of the hour. Okay, and so he says, the power of God is unto salvation for whosoever believeth. That is the one he's talking about. He's saying that the arm of the Lord has been revealed and all the nations shall see. They shall see. That means it's unavoidable for the person of Jesus Christ not to be a revelation. You know, there are people who are praying, oh God, move in our times like you moved in the early church. That's a wrong prayer. He has not refused to move. No, your prayer should be cause us to understand how you work. Cause us to understand how to move like you moved in the early church. For somebody praying for understanding or wisdom, that's one thing. But don't ask God to move like he was moving. And oh, there's even this funny thought that, oh, you know, God is no longer moving like he used to move in the past. No, he is still moving now like he was moving in the past. It's the same today, yesterday and forever. We just do not know how to plug into what God is doing. And like I said, there are Christians, believers across the world that have seen phenomenal miracles, phenomenal power, phenomenal signs. Oh, and you say, oh no, it's not as frequent as, no, in your world maybe. In your world. Because it's not working in your world. It does not mean that it doesn't work in the world of another person. No. For some people, live in a world where the word of God is working in all its full efficiency, in all its full integrity. Okay? But the issue is, is the arm of the Lord revealed? That's what Isaiah is asking. Oh, I'm not seeing the power of God. Is the arm of the Lord revealed? Is the arm of the Lord revealed to you? Okay, but when the man says, who shall believe our report? He's trying to show how hard, not impossible, but how hard it is for men to connect to the faith that activates the power of God according to divine purpose. He's showing, he's trying to express who shall believe, who shall believe. The Bible says somewhere in John chapter 12, Verses 37, he says, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. I tell people that it's not enough for people to see miracles, but they are necessary. They are important, but it's not enough. Someone can see all the power in the world in a ministry and still doubt the man's God. You understand? So it's not just about all oh, miracles. No, but they are important. So he tells them, okay, if you don't believe the word that I'm saying, he says, believe me for the miracles. He's saying, believe me for the miracles. The only challenge is that we are living in a time where we, the ministers of God, are becoming a mystery, okay? 
And when we create mysticism around us, when we create mysticism around us as ministers of the gospel, okay, we complicate the simplicity which is in Christ, all right? Because now people then have to demystify us even as we demystify Christ. But that's not supposed to be the way of the Spirit. No, we the ministers are supposed to live in the simplest way of life that we don't add to the baggage, okay, of men trying to demystify the person of Christ by also demystifying us. We are not the mystery. Uh-uh, Christ is the mystery. This is the mystery that was hid and now revealed. He says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery is not Grace Lubega. No, there are things that create a distinction on my life by reason of the things God has placed on me, all right? But they are not the mystery. Or whatever defines my life, actually, can only be connected in the person of the mystery of Christ. But I don't carry a mystification without the person of Christ, or that I should not entertain a place of trying to mystify myself for men to demystify me, yet my work is the demystification of the mystery Christ. That's wrong. You know, look at Jesus. When Jesus was on the face of the earth, he said, I do as I see my father do. He that heareth me heareth the father because I'm come to do the will of the Father. Jesus on the earth did not try to mystify himself. Jesus on the earth defended and defined the mystery of the Father. The mystery of the Father. And through that, he hopes that when men connect to that mystery, then maybe they can know, you know, him. But firstly, his eyes, the light was lit on the Father. His ministry was on the Father. He's come to do the will of the Father. He's come to please the Father. Not my will, but thy will, O Father. You understand? He's on the cross. He's submitting to the will of the Father. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, if it be possible, take this cup off me. But if it be your will, because it's not the will of the person of Christ, it's the will of the Father at that hour. And so when he ascends in glory, we live in the demystification of the person of Christ as a mystery to those that have to understand him, yet Yet to us who know him, it's given to us to know this mystery, the person of Jesus Christ, because it was hid and now revealed. But because it is revealed, it doesn't mean that everybody in the world understands it. Okay? So it's okay to speak of our oneness with him. So the mystery here, again, still stays with him in us. Without him, we are nothing. He is the vine and we are the branches. Okay? So how do you preach about a branch? How do you demystify a branch without demystification of the root? Okay? Of the vine itself, of the seed from where the roots sprout to give life to the branch. You understand what I'm saying? So it, it takes a certain understanding and wisdom of the spirit. But here Jesus says in John, he says many miracles he did, okay? But they did not believe him. Though he had done many miracles before them, yet they believed him not. And 38 says that then the saying of Isaiah or Esaias, the prophet, might be fulfilled. Now they're going to take us back to Isaiah 53, which is spake, Lord, who hath believed our report and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? not the man of God, but the arm of the Lord revealed. All right? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who has believed our report? And so Jesus is saying that the challenge is dealing with in his day, okay, is the same issue that Isaiah met back in the days years before. He had a challenge with men believing, with men believing. And so sometimes you ask yourself the question, how are men supposed to believe? All right, Romans says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay, so if we hear the word of God, so how come we are still struggling to believe God? It is because maybe what we are hearing, what we are being taught is not demystifying enough of this person for us to connect to the faith that we need for the hour to move in the will and purposes of God, for the arm of God to be strong over you. I have seen that the anointing of God has a way of connecting through the wisdom of the Spirit. This is not a place of emotional people. 
This is a place of wise people. It's a place of understanding the wisdom, the functions in God. That's what Isaiah is trying to emphasize. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He even tried to demonstrate miracles to them. The lame walk, the blind saw, the deaf heart. But they still could not believe. The Pharisees said, crucify him. Crucify him, not the Romans. No, the Romans did not crucify our Lord. It was the very people that hold the sacred scriptures. They held, you know, the books of the patriarchs. They had them in their own hands. They had a system and an order. Okay, they believed in the coming of Yeshua, be it in a more, you know, twisted understanding. But they believed in Jehovah. They knew that God existed. They knew, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But right in there, even though they knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the very men crucified the Lord of glory. The very men. And that is why he later says, for had they known this wisdom, he says, because when we're talking about this wisdom, we're not talking about the wisdom of this world, okay, which none of the princes know. He says, but we speak this wisdom, he says, in a mystery, okay, even the hidden wisdom of God, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And he says, which none of the princes of the world, the Bible says, knew. For had they known this wisdom, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So it's possible to have scriptures in your hands, but lacking the wisdom of God. It's possible to have degrees and PhDs on you, but without the wisdom of God. It's very possible. The men that crucified our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ were Pharisees. They were Sadducees. You know, they were scribes of great works. They carried, you know, basic wisdoms to run their small civilizations. But when the bigger picture, the revelation Christ comes, they cannot connect to him. They can't connect to him. You know, he becomes a stumbling block to them. He becomes the one that intercepts their visions, their programs, their ministries, their work, and all sorts of things. Yet before them, God has set salvation and a savior. But their eyes were blinded. Okay, and up to this moment, there are people who are speaking in tongues. There are people who are in prayer mountains. I've seen people who pray. I mean pray, and they're broke. I've seen people who pray, and I mean pray, and they're sick. I've seen ministers who pray, and I mean pray, and have failed in ministry. I've seen people who pray, and I mean pray, and when they open the Bible, they cannot even define the first principles of the oracles. So am I against prayer? No, I'm not against prayer. Men have prayed. Men will be praying tomorrow. Men will be praying next year. Men will create mysteries around prayer. Are you hearing me? But there is something about connecting to the heart of wisdom in God in getting the revelation of this arm that is revealed. In getting to the revelation of this arm that is revealed to the hour. There's something about it. Now, the Hebrew word, okay, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed, the Hebrew word for revealed is gaula. And gaula means to uncover, to denude, right? To make naked, to denude in a disgraceful sense. Okay? To uncover and denude in a disgraceful sense. To make naked in a disgraceful sense. To disgrace someone. For example, if I get somebody and I strip them naked before, you know, public, that is gaula, right? And so he's saying, to whom is the arm of the Lord gaula? To whom is the arm of the Lord, you know, denuded disgracefully? Follow me. He's trying to say, who has gotten the revelation of the crucifixion. Who has gotten the revelation of the wounding? Who has gotten the revelation of the bruising? Because remember when Jesus is arrested, he is galad. He's stripped naked, right? He's stripped naked and he's smitten. He's wounded our transgressions, you know? All of that happening, right? That whole experience of the uncovering, all right? And Isaiah is talking about this as the revelation. 
He's saying, to whom is the power of God revealed in its weakest hour, in its weakest moment, in its naked state? To whom is the power of God to fulfill divine purpose revealed in its weakest state, in its most sorry state, in its most disadvantaged state? in its persecuted state, in its disgraceful state, he's trying to tell us that you can never connect to the power of God, the arm of the Lord, until you understand the most disgraceful experience of the person of Jesus Christ, until you understand the sufferings of the Christ. All right? That is why when Paul is talking about that suffering, he says that I might, you know, fellowship with the sufferings, that I might experience the power of his resurrection. Okay, you see, you can only fellowship that I may know him and the power of his resurrection by fellowshipping in his sufferings and being made conformable to his death. You see, in being conformed to his death in fellowship of those sufferings, Paul says that is the only way I will know him and the power of his resurrection. That's the only way I can understand the power that he wrought when he was raised from the dead and made a public spectacle of the devil triumphing over all of them and coming back in that glory to give gifts to men, to understand the sufferings, to understand the death of the person of Jesus Christ, then you'll understand the arm of the Lord. You can never understand the power of God without understanding the sufferings and death of Christ. That is why he's trying to tell you. Now, if we go back to Isaiah 53, he says, who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now, he starts to define this arm, okay? And he says, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. You see, he's tender. He's tender. He's not advantaged. This is the one we're talking about. That tenderness is weakness, all right? And the Bible says, and as a root out of a dry ground. That means the atmosphere, the ground here, you know, the atmosphere was not advantageous for the man that we are preaching for the hour. Okay, and then he continues to say, and he has no form of comeliness. All right, he has no form of comeliness. And when we shall see him, he says, there is no beauty that we should desire in him. In other words, Jesus was not handsome by the standards of the world. He was not handsome. He was not attractive that women followed him because he was a very good looking guy. And I believe God knew that probably if he would make a certain face, some women would simply believe. But the Jesus you're talking about, the Bible says there was no beauty that we should desire of him. In other words, if he stood probably among seven or eight boys, there's nothing that would tell you, oh, this guy's, you know, as attractive and he's, you know, he's caught our eye this way. No, there was nothing beautiful about him. And all of this, Isaiah is saying, in its deep denotation, it is trying to express the revelation of this arm, the revelation of this power. No wonder when Paul is speaking about his weaknesses, he says, for when I am weak, then I know that I'm strong. Because he says, for our strength is made perfect in weakness. Because he saw the pattern with the person of Christ, that in whatever weakness was around the person of Christ, there in there was the strength of God in him. And he continues to say, there is no beauty that we should desire in him. In verses 3, the Bible says he is despised and rejected of men. He was a rejected fellow. He was not a favored fellow. Okay? He was not favored by men. And he was a man of sorrows, all right? And acquainted with grief. He was acquainted with grief, right? And we hid him, the Bible says, as it were our faces from him. That means he became shameful. He was a man that to connect with him, he was shameful. Peter denied him. Peter himself denied him, yet he believed in the man. The Bible says he was despised. And the Bible says, and we, he's now talking of the men of that time, the carnal nature of men, the Pharisees, the Sadducees of that hour. He says, we esteemed him not. Jesus did not walk this world in esteem. There's only one moment of popularity in the Christ was when now he's entering, you know, uh, Jerusalem and then they get a donkey and then they put their clothes down and then the Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord and seven days later he's being crucified. He only has one popular hour, the triumphant entry in Jerusalem. All through before that there is no esteem of this man we're talking about. But you must carry that revelation. And the Bible now continues to say, surely, now we're coming to the mystery here. He says, surely he has borne our griefs 
and carried our sorrows. The Bible says, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. In all of the things that he's trying to do, the carnal men look at Jesus Christ as one who is smitten and afflicted of God because they think that the Pharisees, the Sadducees of that hour, they are of God and Jesus Christ is of the devil. He should be crucified because he has blasphemed the temple. He has blasphemed the name of God by calling himself the Messiah and all these sorts of things you need to do. And then he continues to say, but, but, Isaiah now sees the mystery. He says, but, but, this fellow we don't esteem, who has no beauty on him, who we think is smitten, stricken and afflicted of God, who is in comeliness and he's a tender fruit as a dry seed in the ground. He's, but that fellow, he says, was wounded, he says, for our transgressions and he was bruised, the Bible says, for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And the Bible says, and with his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah sees the mystery. But this is a man he's talking about. That man has not yet come in the flesh. That means Isaiah connected to the old script of the Lamb of God, like the book of Revelation says, that was slain before the foundations of the world. In Revelation 13, it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Isaiah walks into the ancient days and connects to the mystery of the death and resurrection of the Christ. And it's almost as though it was inevitable that one man should die, like the high priest Caiaphas said, for the salvation of many. But yet Caiaphas did not speak in the revelation of this man. No, he spoke, the Bible says, because he was the high priest of that year of that hour. That means that there's revelation that can be accorded according to the man's office. But it's another thing when it touches the revelation that is accorded to the man because that man has connected to the heart of God. When you connect to the heart of God, you connect to the power of God. When you connect to the heart of God, you connect to the arm of the Lord. You connect to the evident wonder working power. The challenge is that we are living in a generation that is so uh, short-cutted. It's so, you know, fixed excited in how things are supposed to work, that people don't tarry, people don't seek God. People don't break and bend and die before the altar of understanding. People are not available and acquainted to the things and the way of the Spirit. And to them, Christ is just the end of a means. I need a job, so let me go to church. I need, you know, a husband, so let me go to fellowship. Let me tune in. Maybe I'll stop fearing COVID. Let me do this because maybe this disease will leave me. And that's how some people are connecting. But disconnect yourself from all of that stuff and create a life where you yield your heart entirely to God. The Bible says, my son, give me thine heart. Because when you're giving your heart, the Bible says in Proverbs, your eyes will observe the ways of the Spirit. Proverbs 23, 26. Your eyes will start to observe the ways of the Spirit. Your eyes will observe the ways of the Spirit. Now, Isaiah, who is not in our time, sees Jesus Christ and him crucified and him raised in glory. And the answer of why healing must take place in the time of Christ. And he's seeing that all has passed because he connected to the lamb which was slain from the foundation of the world. That is a man of God. That is a man of God. That is a man who has connected to the heart of God, that the purposes of God has been fully revealed to that man's heart. And when they are, that man will know the old and the new. The Bible says, every scribe that is instructed in the kingdom, his Bible says, of heaven is likened unto a man that is a householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure. The Bible says, both new and old things, you will realize that Jesus Christ, the revelation, okay, when it comes to your spirit, it gets you from the beginning, the ancient of ages, and takes you to the end of things. I tell people, when you come back from that experience, that's when you'll understand what it means to be refined. The refining fire of the Spirit. That's the deepest level of consecration. Because it introduces you to the God out of time. And time simply becomes the element among the other elements of God. So it's easy for you to understand the future. It's easy for you to know your next week. It's easy for you to know your next year. Nobody needs to tell you. You would know. You would know. Because to know him, to know Jesus Christ, 
you know, and the power of his resurrection. It's the ultimate calling for the body of Christ and the church. And why we don't see this spies? Because he's not a revelation. Christ is not a revelation. He's not a revelation. He's an idea. And because we've cultivated experiences of talking about him, some people now think that they know him because they know about him. But to know God is a different experience. To relate with God is a different experience. What the world is looking for now is not another church, another building, another fellowship. And No. What the world is looking for are men and women of God who can demystify this mystery, who are instructed in the kingdom, not in the process of being instructed, Gnosko, who are instructed. They've gotten to the end of this conversation. I tell people, if we had men like Isaiah in this day, men would be telling the next four, five hundred years to come. And I believe that there are men out there of God. But that may God continue increasing this awareness, this awakening, this understanding spiritually. You'd see men speaking things that can only be understood in 100, 200, 300, 400 years. Not simply, you know, speaking for the moment and, you know, connecting to things that are, you know, in simple dates and months of simple years and little time frames. No, we would go even out of time, we would have conversations that are heavenly. Are you hearing me? And that when men start talking, when you hear a man speaking, you're like, mm -mm, this is not a book. This is not a CD. This is a man who has connected to the heart of God. This is a woman who has connected to the heart of God. Believe me, the world will come. The world will align. Things will get in order. Why? Because the arm of the Lord is revealed. And that is what is telling us. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who shall believe our report? Who will believe this? That the arm of the Lord, Jesus Christ, in the demonstration of his power is best understood in the weaknesses of his hour. And how many people have come to the understanding, have you ever taken time to study the wounding? Have you ever taken time to study the bruises? Have you ever taken time to study the tender shoot? Because it's weakness for him to come as a son of David. Yet he is the Lord over David. It's weakness to come as a seed of Abraham, yet he is the God of Abraham. But is that a revelation? And so if the revelation of this person is not there, we cannot continue speaking about, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, with Jesus, with Jesus, with Jesus. And he says, oh, one will come and give you a Jesus we preach not, a gospel that was not preached in the spirit, that was not given. He says, and that you bear him yourself. Because today, people talk about a Jesus that is not even scripture, but our people can't even tell anymore the difference. Why? Because we are so engrossed in what we need for the hour and not what he needs of us in the hour. I believe that God is raising a generation. He's raising a people. He's raising a number out there. We might not know their number, but they're there. They're not two, they're not three, and not just one special guy, one special woman. No, they are a group of people. They are elect by God. And I believe that he is dealing in this hour. Let me tell you, if we come to this full understanding as the body of Christ, governments will change toward God. Even the most dictatorial governments in the world will bow to our God. No gun will be able to stop us. No principle in the earth, will, no element will be able to stop us. No nuclear warhead will be able to stop us. No atomic weapon will be able to stop us. Why? Because the arm of the Lord is a revelation. And that's what I want to pray for you today. That's what I want to share with you. That's what my heart has been burning to share with you this week. That if there's a prayer you're going to make in this season, even while we're waiting on the Lord, is that God, may you be revealed to me than you have ever been revealed to me. My part will be clear. My lot will be clear. My responsibility will be clear. My understanding will be clear. The people that are dying, Yet you who is watching me have the answer. 
Now we're living in a time where believers doubt the healing power of God, where believers doubt the wonder-working spirit of God, or some loosely believe it, they believe it, but they don't believe it. May God help us. I want you to open your mouth right now and start to speak to God. If you have tongues, speak them. If you speak any other language, whichever language the Lord has given you, just open your mouth and speak to God and tell him, God, help us, help us, help us, oh God. Reveal yourself to us more and more. Give us understanding of your power, of your glory. Help us understand the fellowship of your sufferings. May our spirits conform to your death, that we might see resurrection power, your resurrection power in our lives. That may that anointing that resurrect everything be evidently functional in our lives. And our bodies will resurrect in the name of Jesus. Our families will resurrect in the name of Jesus. Our careers resurrect in the name of Jesus. Our dreams resurrect in the name of Jesus. Our ministries resurrect in the name of Jesus. Our giftings resurrect in the name of Jesus. Oh, Shiba Katalapa Yereko Brako Talapa. Jireko Prazalapa Kayele Boko Sharalalaba. Robo Shireke Prazalapa Yeko Pakatalapa Yerebo. O Ribo Jire Reko Satalapa Yereba Baba Kosalapaya. O Ribo Jire Ketele Payala Lile Boko Jarabako Shakata. Roti le baya raba koshere mando robo zakata la paya. Roko tala paya raba baba kosha raba zele pa. Rosi ketele paya ramando robo Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Because you're revealing yourself to somebody. You're revealing yourself to that man. You're revealing yourself to that minister. You're revealing yourself to that woman. You're revealing yourself to that young man, to that young woman right now. Just continue praying. Just continue tiring. I feel that people in this season are having mighty visits. Some people are going to have those visits in dreams. Some of you are going to have them in visions right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And some of you, your eyes are opening to an understanding like you have never had before in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And now the sick are getting healed in the name of Jesus Christ. For those of you who are watching me right now and you say, you know what, as I was listening, I feel like I need to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to give you an opportunity to receive Receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. And if you're there, I want you to just repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for today. I thank you for my life. I thank you because you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Tonight, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.